Welcome to First Parish in Needham Unitarian Universalist. I am Jesse Bowen, chair of our music committee. First Parish is a Unitarian Universalist congregation founded in 1711 along with the town of Needham. We are proud to be certified as a welcoming congregation for our inclusivity of people of all sexual orientations and gender identities and expressions. As a green sanctuary, for our commitment to addressing the climate crisis, and as a level two sanctuary supporting congregation for our work in immigration reform and anti-deportation efforts. Whether you are a first time visitor or a lifelong member, you can learn more about all that's happening at First Parish by going to our website, uuneedham.org, or following us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. As you know, what's happening right now at the congregation is very different than usual because of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. Our building is closed and we are gathering online only, as is recommended by health officials and local government. We encourage everyone to engage with one another through video and phone calls during this time and keep connected even as we keep our distance. Our Sunday services are pre-recorded by our wonderful staff and worship volunteers and streamed on Sunday morning so we can all enjoy the familiar routine of spending Sundays together. Our first parish community has gotten creative about how we can stay in touch and renew our spirits without meeting in person. And we hope you have been plugging into our Zoom gathering opportunities throughout the week. For example, you are invited to our Zoom social hour directly following this worship service. Please find the link in your Saturday Bell Notes email. If you're joining us for the first time this Sunday, or you don't know what we're talking about when we refer to the Saturday Bell Notes or the emailed order of service, you can sign up to be included in those emails next week by going to our website, 
uuneedem.org and clicking Get Involved, then click Newsletter, or sending your request to office at uuneedem.org. We know this way of worshiping and gathering together is an adjustment for all of us. However, our sincere hope and prayer is that these online services and connection opportunities will help us keep the physical distance required during this corona pandemic without losing much of the spiritual, emotional, and social closeness we treasure in our faith community. Welcome again to all, and good morning. Our chalice lighting this morning was written by Florence Kaplow, Minister of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Urbana-Champaign in Urbana, Illinois. We light this chalice in honor of the animal realm, furred and hoofed, two-legged, four-legged, many-legged, fanged and clawed, gentle and fierce, wild and tame. May we remember that all animals are our relatives, worthy of our care and respect. In the Unitarian Universalist tradition, the covenant is a set of promises the membership of the church strives to honor with one another and out in the world. Please say along with me from wherever you are, the words of our First Parish Covenant, as printed in your emailed order of service and shown on your screen. We gather as a loving community to encourage and comfort one another. We gather as a diverse community to support each other in our search for spiritual truth. We gather as a service community to live our beliefs through action and care for our world. Though we cannot gather together in person during this time, we are living these promises every day. Good morning again. We begin this morning with a reflection and then share a moment of silence. Ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee, or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. Watch, simply listen. They will not speak to us, but to one another they say much. Some of it we hear, the rest is beyond words. I want to listen to open to the possibilities. A moment of silence. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Trouble isn't easy, trouble brings doubt. Fear comes in and the joy goes out. How are we gonna make it? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna make it when trouble comes through? We'll take it bird by bird. Little at a time, take it bird by bird and stone by stone. Little at a time, take it stone by stone. Change isn't easy, change is hard. Fear comes in, it can tear you apart. How are we gonna make it? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna make it when change comes through? We'll take it bird by bird. Stone. A little bit of time, take it stone by stone. Dreams aren't easy, dreams can get lost. Fear comes in and the dream gets tossed. How are we gonna make it? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna make this dream come true? We'll take it bird by bird, a little at a time, take it bird by bird and stone by stone, a little at a time, take it stone by stone, bird by bird, a little at a time, take it bird by bird and Our readings this morning come from Alfred Russell Wallace and Henry Beston. I thought of the long ages of the past during which the generations of these things of beauty had run their course with no intelligent eye to gaze upon their loveliness to all appearances such a wanton waste of beauty. This consideration must surely tell us that all living things were not made for man. Their happiness and enjoyments, their loves and hates, their struggles for existence, their vigorous life and early death would seem to be immediately related to their own well-being and perpetuation alone. We patronize them for their incompleteness, for the tragic fate of having taken form so far below ourselves, and therein we err and we greatly err. For the animal should not be measured by man. In a world older and more complete than ours, they move finished and complete, gifted with extensions of the senses we have lost or never attained, living by voices we shall never hear. They are not brethren, they are not underlings, they are other nations, caught with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and travail of the earth. This congregation has been supported by the volunteer time and treasure of its members and friends since its founding in 1711. In those 300 years, this community has seen some tough times, but we're still here. This is the time in our service when we, the modern stewards of this church, offer to give what we can to build and sustain the world we envision. For the entire summer, our plate collection will be divided equally between First Parish in Needham and the Needham Community Council, which is a local nonprofit which runs, among other things, our local food pantry. As you know, the pantry can no longer accept donated food, but its customer list has dramatically grown through this pandemic. Our neighbors are depending on this service now more than ever. To donate to today's offering, you can use one of three different methods. For those of you with a smartphone, you can use our new text to give program. Just put in the phone number 73256 and text to that number, UU Needham space plate space, then the dollar sign with the amount you'd like to give all in one message. If you want your money to apply to your pledge, please text instead 
the same phone number, 73256, with UU Needham, space pledge 20, space dollar sign and the amount you'd like to give, or pledge 21 with the same instructions. And if you miss those instructions, they will be on your screen for a short time while we listen to the music of the offering. If you'd prefer to mail First Parish a check, please make it out to First Parish in Needham. Put the date of this service and the word collection in the memo line, and then mail your check to 23 Denham Avenue, Needham, Mass, 02492. Alternatively, if you want the money applied to your pledge for either the fiscal year just finishing or the upcoming year, put FY20 or FY21 in that memo line instead. The last and the perhaps the easiest method is to use our website, uuneedham.org, to make your donation. There is a giving button in the upper right-hand corner with a drop-down menu where you'll find an entry labeled Donate Now. Following that link and signing into your Realm account, you'll be able to fill in your donation information and choose a recipient fund for its destination, such as plate collection. Thank you for everything you are able to give to help support and sustain this congregation and the vital work of our community partners. Please take these next few minutes to give what you can and know it will be gratefully received. How can we know what animals think and feel? What does it even mean to know what animals think and feel? They aren't people. Skepticism regarding knowing anything about animals lasted a long time. Entrapped in behaviorism and a concern of projecting our inner lives onto animals. Carl Safina in his book Beyond Words discusses this history as a practicing biologist. That book is the basis for much of this service. I don't want to turn this into a mini lyceum. I want to get back to telling stories, but this point deserves some remarks. We move beyond a behaviorist to black box view of animals with the pioneering work of people like Donald Griffin and Jane Goodall. Griffin was famous having figured out how bats use sonar to navigate. But when he wrote the book, The Question of Animal Awareness in the 1970s, he was almost banished from the field. Cautions to young biologists and zoologists persisted as late as 1992. Jane Goodall began by simply spending days and days in social communion with her subjects 
observing and noting. But behaviorist biologists weren't convinced until more was learned about animal neurology and until our mathematics caught up to the challenge. Now you can film citizens or, or elephants and document and measure how they relate to one another using algorithms operating on video. People and machines can discern these patterns then. These can be combined with audio recordings, analyzed with spectrography, and these reveal emotional cues. And so now the evidence for intelligent communication and social hierarchies and social learning among elephants is overwhelming. What might trouble us though, is that if you define consciousness as Dr. Dr. Christoph Koch does, that quote, consciousness is the thing that feels like something, end quote, a great many creatures exhibit aspects of it, not only elephants and whales, but mollusks and worms and honeybees. It's Koch's business to know, heading the Allen Institute for Brain Science in Seattle. But let's leave where that leads to another time. Back to Safina. Quoting now for the rest of this sermon. To survive the drought, different elephant families tried different strategies. Some tried to stay close to the swamp, but they did very badly as it dried. Some went far north where there were many poachers, many for the first time in their lives. They did better. Out of 58 families, only one family did not lose anybody. One family lost seven adult females and 13 youngsters. Usually, if an elephant goes down, the family gathers around and tries to lift it. In the drought, they had no energy, watching them dying, seeing them on the ground in agony. One in four elephants perished. Nearly every nursing baby died. About 80% of the zebras and wildebeest died. Nearly all of the Maasai's cattle, even people died. So when the rain returned, the surviving female elephants bereft of babies all cycled into estrus about the same time, resulting in the biggest elephant baby boom in 40 years. Dr. Cynthia Moss, a veteran watcher of elephants says, water makes elephants, water makes elephants happy. Elephants experience joy. It may not be human joy, but it is joy. Cynthia explains, elephants don't seem aware of details until something changes. One day, a cameraman working with Cynthia decided that for a different angle, he'd position himself underneath the research vehicle. The oncoming elephants, who usually just passed by the vehicle, immediately noticed, stopped and stared. Why was a human under the car? A male ma named Mr. Nick snaked his slithering, sniffing trunk under there to investigate. He was not aggressive and did not try to pull the man out. He was just curious. Another day, when the vehicle appeared with a special door designed for filming, elephants came exploring, actually touching the new door with their trunk. Mikatito Sayala, another field biologist, a native Maasai, tall and capable, Katito has been studying free living elephants with Cynthia Moss for more than two decades. Katito says, you have to know everyone. Yes. How many is everyone, I ask? I can recognize all the adult females. So, Katito considers, say 900 to 1,000. Say 900, yes. Recognizing hundreds and hundreds of elephants on sight, how is this possible? Some she knows by marks, the position of a hole in an ear, for, for instance. But many she just glances at. They're that familiar, just like your friends are. A story with Katito, and then we'll get going. Vicky Fishlock, another scientist, says, they're not ignoring us. They have an expectation of politeness, and we're fulfilling it. So they're not paying us any mind. They weren't always like this to me, she asked. When I, when I started, they were used to vehicles snapping a few pictures and moving along. They were not wildly happy about me just sitting and watching them for long periods. They expect you to behave in a certain way. If you don't, they will let you know that they notice. Not in a threatening way. You might get a head shake and it look like, what's your problem? Through hummocks and bush in our vehicle, we amble along with them. A, an elephant named Tekla, walking just a few yards ahead to our right, suddenly turns, trumpets, and generally objects to us. To our left, a young elephant wheels and screams. Sorry, 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 Katito says to Tekla. She breaks to a stop, turning off the ignition. It appears to me that they, we have separated this mother from her baby. But Tekla is not the mother. Another female, whose two breasts are full of milk, runs over, cutting in just in front of us. This one actually is the mother. Basically, Tekla was communicating, yeah, humans are getting between you and your baby. Come and do something. Katito offers, elephants, they are like human beings, very intelligent. I like their characters. I like the way they behave and hold their family, the way they protect, yes. Mother rejoins baby, restoring order. We slowly proceed. When one individual knows another's relationship to a third, as Tekla knows who the baby's, mother's, baby's mother is, 
It's called understanding third-party relationships. Primates understand third-party relationships too, and so do wolves, hyenas, dolphins, birds of the crow family, and at least some parrots. A parrot, say, can act jealous of its keeper's spouse. When the vervet monkeys that are common around camp hear an infant's distress call, they instantly look to the infant's mother. They know exactly who they and everyone else are. They understand precisely who is important to whom. When freely living dolphin mothers want young ones to stop interacting with humans, the mothers sometimes direct a tail slap at the human who has the baby's attention, signaling in effect, end the game, I need my child's attention. When the dawdling youngsters are interacting with dolphin researcher Denise Hertzing's graduate assistants, their mothers occasionally direct those, what could we call them, reprimands? At Hertzing herself, this shows that the dolphins understand that Hertzing is the leader of all the humans in the water. For fr free living creatures to perceive rank order in humans, just astonishing. What I find most amazing about it, Vicky sums up, is that we can understand each other. We learn the elephant's invisible boundaries. We have a shared experience because, she adds with a twinkle, we've all got the same basic brain. Thus ends our story. We always extinguish our chalice with words promising to carry its flame in our hearts until we are together again. And I know that I and you and all of us are deeply committed to that promise, no matter how long it is until we are together again. As we extinguish our chalice today, please join me from home in saying these words written by Unitarian Universalist Minister Reverend Eliz Elizabeth Sally Jones. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, nor the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. benediction this morning begins with a reading with, from Black Elk, moves on to Carl Safina, and ends with a passage from Devery. A reading from Black Elk. It was the story of a mighty vision given to a man too weak to use it, of a holy tree that should have flourished in a people's heart with flowers and singing birds, and now is withered, and of a people's dream. But if the vision was true and mighty, as I know, it is it's true and mighty yet. So such things are of the spirit, and it is in the darkness of their eyes that men get lost. From Carl Safina. Understanding other animals is not a boutique endeavor. Failure will speed their end in the bankrupting of our world. And if we treated animals as they deserve, human inhumanity to humans would stand out all the more appallingly. We might then turn our attention to the next step beyond human civilization, humane civilization, justice for all. 
it remains to be seen whether human intelligence will continue to succeed or become a catastrophe. The most beautiful thing about our minds might be the occasional triumphal moment when we see ourselves not in the mirror, but from a distance. We see the whole universe through a human lens. The harder step is to get outside ourselves, look back at where and how we live. There is no better prayer to morning than to feel glad to know. The greatest story is that all life is one. Quoting Devarim, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have put before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life.